All right, so in this video, I'm going to be talking about a reaction that can be used to make nitriles and whose mechanism we'll be looking at a little bit in the next class. Uh, this mechanism actually involves formation of a nitrile from another functional group that we've talked about a little bit before, but one that we'll focus on more in later chapters, uh, which is this. You guys have seen this before. This is an amide, uh, one of the most biologically important functional groups around. So we have a four carbon amide there, and we can actually convert that to the corresponding nitrile, which looks like this, through what is essentially a kind of elimination reaction, because you can see we are essentially losing H2. O. Now, that does not mean that we're losing water. We're just losing those elements of hydrogen and oxygen. We'll lose them in a particular way uh, that don't necessarily involve water, but that involve the reagents that we'll talk about. Now, we said this was an <coughs> elimination, or has it an elimination part to it. And so the reagent that's going to allow us to do that is one that we've seen before, SOCl2. We've seen thionyl chloride, SOCl2, as an eliminating agent before. We've also seen it as a way to convert an alcohol into an alkyl chloride. The book shows this on page 615, in case you're wondering. It shows this reaction. It shows thionyl chloride. It also shows benzene. Um, I don't want to stress too much on this, though benzene is just the solvent. It also says a particular temperature, but again, I'm not bothered about that. It's, uh, I'm not really picky about reaction temperatures. Uh, so the main thing here is the thionyl chloride. Because that is involved in the mechanism, the benzene and the temperature are just there to help the mechanism proceed. So let's talk a little bit about what actually happens. But you can see the overall reaction is the conversion of an amide to a nitrile. All right. So let's go ahead and start off with our amide. And I'm just going to draw the same thing out again. So here is our amide right here. And one thing you might wonder to begin with is, well, I hate this bloody thing when it does that. All right, hang on a minute. Let me try that again. Box. All right, OK. There's our oxygen, and there is our nitrogen. Uh, now, when we have thionyl chloride around, thionyl chloride essentially looks like this. You have an electrophilic sulfur that's surrounded by two chlorines and an oxygen. The oxygen pulls electrons in one way, the two chlorines pull electrons in two other ways, leaving you with a very electropositive sulfur, so something that's very electrophilic, so a nucleophile can just come in and attack you. So that brings up the question in the molecule like an amide, which is more nucleophilic? Is it the nitrogen or is it the oxygen? We've seen before that nitrogen is usually more electrophilic than oxygen, but there is some reason that actually explains why the oxygen in this case is more electrophilic than the nitrogen. The mechanism in the book shows, actually the mechanism in the book is a little unclear, so I'm going to make it, try and make it a little bit clearer. The oxygen is actually more, electro, um, more nucleophilic than the nitrogen. Now, we can't see that directly, but we can use something to allow us to see why the oxygen is more electronegative. Uh, not electronegative, more nucleophilic, I should say. Now, this arrow that I've just drawn, we've seen this before. This is a resonance arrow. So I'm going to see, can we draw out a resonance structure of this amide that we started off with? The fact is we can. Um, and can we use it to show why the oxygen is more electronegative? Oh, man, I did it again. Can we use it to show why the oxygen is more nucleophilic than the nitrogen? Well, 
Let's start off with these electrons on the nitrogen. Where can they go? We know nitrogen can make one more bond, so it could go into this carbon-nitrogen bond. And if that happens, you've got a Texas carbon here, so this pi bond on the oxygen can break. And when you redraw this out, we still have our four carbons. Now we have the nitrogen with the two hydrogens on it because of that, it has a plus charge. All right. And now the oxygen doesn't have two long pairs on it anymore. It's got three. And because of that, it's got a minus charge. And that is the reason why in an amide, the oxygen is more nucleophilic than the nitrogen. Because you can shift through resonance those electron pairs onto the oxygen. Try and do it the other way with electrons coming down from here. You can't do that because then you've got to break a sigma bond and that isn't going to happen. Okay, so what do we think is going to happen then between these two, or between this and this? Well, we've already said that the sulfur is electrophilic at the sulfur. So the O- is going to attack the SOCl2 in a very particular position, and it's going to be the sulfur. All right, so that just goes like so. And let's see if we can draw out what we get. I'm just going to draw our amide out here. Now, in this case, I'm actually going to draw on the two bonds between nitrogen and hydrogen because they are going to become of particular importance here. So that's a plus charge. Oops, yeah, there's a plus charge. And now the oxygen has, uh, let's see. Yeah, the oxygen has given itself that extra bond. Now, this is where the mechanism differs a little bit from what I'm showing and what the book is showing. When this, when these electrons first attack the sulfur, the book shows that one of the chlorines breaks off. But that's not exactly how it happens. We've seen before that when you can break potentially a sigma bond or a pi bond, it's always the pi bond that breaks first. And that's exactly what we're going to see here. So here is our oxygen at O minus, and we still have our two chlorines on here. And all the book did was kind of take two steps and combine them into one. What actually happens here is this oxygen goes down onto here, kicks the electrons down onto there, and kicks out a chlorine that way. The book said that goes in here and kicks that out so it's a little bit more involved than that. So let's see if we can draw out the product that we get from here. Let's move on to the next page. So what I'm going to have drawn out here is oxygen, sulfur, with a double bond to the oxygen, then to the chlorine, and all the rest is going to stay the same. So let's see if I can remember how to draw that. So we had this here. All right, so we have this. And here is our oxygen. Here is our sulfur. Uh, we've just formed that double bond here to this. All right, and so there we go. We still have our plus charge here. All right. So what happens at this point is, well, you have a nitrogen that's not particularly happy. It wants to have that plus charge removed and so some species and the book here's where we have to be careful the book doesn't really specify what that species is it just says it's a base so I'm going to do the same thing I'm just going to say it's base so let's say maybe let's say OH minus all right it doesn't really matter what it actually could be water as well I suppose but let's just do this OH minus to remove that plus charge from the nitrogen it's going to attack that hydrogen and kick those electrons onto the nitrogen there. And what we end up with is this. We actually get something that looks like what you may have seen before, something like an imine, sort of, not exactly an imine, but it's close. And you can see we're getting closer and closer to our nitrile product, because a nitrile would actually involve 
carbon-carbon triple bond here. All right. And you know what? To make this uh, a little clearer, I'm actually going to say my other hydrogen is pointing down like this. Oops. Now, the reason why I want to say it this way is um, I said at the start of the video that there was a elimination uh, step in this mechanism, and it's actually coming up here. It's an E2 elimination. And I want to see if we can remember what an E2 elimination sort of looks like. So I'm, I'm going to draw one down here. An E2 elimination would look something like this. We'd have to have an alkyl halide or it could be an alcohol too, but let's say we have an alkyl halide. Now because we have an elimination, we need a base, and again, let's just use OH-. Now if we have an elimination, do you guys remember what functional group we're going to form if it's an elimination? Well, we're going to be forming an alkene, we're going to be forming a pi bond between two carbons. And if this is an E2 elimination, how many steps would this be happening in? Would your leaving group come off first and then the base attack, or would everything happen at once? Well, the fact is it's E2, like SN2, everything would happen all together. All right? Uh, and so for that reason, it's probably better if we actually have this as a hydrogen here, so this then becomes secondary. Anyway. We said everything's happening together, all right? And in fact, you know what, tell you what, sorry to mess you guys are about me. Uh, let me put my hydrogen down here. I'm going to have that as a carbon. I'm going to put my hydrogen here. So base is going to grab that hydrogen. This carbon-hydrogen bond breaks, kicks those electrons into that carbon-carbon bond, and this can only occur if there's a leaving group that can leave, which is this. And that is an E2 elimination. Base attacking, double bond forming, and leaving group leaving all at the same time. E2, one step. So we're going to make that analogy to what we have up here. If we have some more base lying around, and let's just say that it's water that we've just formed. All right, in our last step. Can we draw out some sort of corresponding E2 elimination step that looks like this that allows us to form our nitrile. Well, let's see what we can do. The base attacks the hydrogen. The carbon-hydrogen bond here broke, forming a pi bond. The same is going to happen here, except it's going to be a hydrogen-nitrogen bond. It's going to break. It's going to form a pi bond, but there's already a pi bond here. So essentially, it's going to form another pi bond. Now, that can't happen unless there's a leaving group that can leave, which is going to be what all this group is. These electrons will go uh, either onto the oxygen or onto this bond. The book shows the electrons going onto the bond, so let me see if I can show you guys exactly what that means. Hopefully, you guys can all see that this bond is breaking. All right. Uh, one of the reaction products here, and actually the main driving force for why this decomposes the way it does, is that you form sulfur dioxide. And this is a gas, and its formation drives the reaction forward. Uh, so we can show this um, with two single arrows. This, this bond breaks, and these electrons go into this bond. So it's kind of jumping from one bond to another. Notice when we do that, we form a double bond between the sulfur and the oxygen. There's already a double bond between the sulfur and the oxygen here. And this group then becomes sulfur dioxide. But that can only happen if the chlorine leaves so the chlorine gets kicked off. So what we end up getting here is we get our nitrile. We get SO2, and we get our Cl-. Now, we have 
H3O plus here and Cl minus, essentially the same thing as saying HCl, and that's what the uh, book says that you get. But the important thing is, you've gone from a molecule here that, warped, that had one pi, so there's one pi bond here and one sigma bond in this double bond. You form another pi bond here, giving you two pi bonds and one sigma. You formed a triple bond. This E2 mechanism looks like so. Hydrogen comes off, it forms that extra pi bond, kicks out the leaving group, and exactly the same thing happens here. Now, if you're a little unsure about this, then here's another way that you can show it. You could have equally well showed, I'm, I'm not going to draw the whole thing out here. You could have equally well showed something like this. Uh, those electrons come into here. You can kick those electrons onto the oxygen instead. But just remember that if you do, just erase this. If you do, you get your site you get your nitrile here, and what you end up with is something that looks like this. There's a minus here. And then you can just do the arrows that happen here. That goes into there and kicks that out. Ultimately, it gets you to the same product. Anyway, that overall is the mechanism for the dehydration of, or elimination, I should say, of an amide to form a nitrile. All right.